Hello, and welcome back to the History of Ancient Greece, Episode 48, Food, Wine, and the Symposium. Food played an important role in ancient Greek thought. Herodotus, for example, identified people partly in terms of the food that they ate and what they drank. The Greek authors, including Herodotus, Stesius, and Strabo, took pleasure in describing the decadence of non-Greek barbarians, in contrast to the Greeks, who stressed the austerity of their own diet. Ancient Greek cuisine was characterized by its frugality, partly because of the physical and climatic conditions of the country, and partly because this agricultural hardship was held as virtuous. While they did not ignore the pleasures of eating, They valued the simplicity. Their diet was founded on the so-called Mediterranean triad, wheat, olive oil, and wine. Our knowledge of ancient Greek cuisine and eating habits is derived mostly from Aristophanes' comedies and quotes of other comedians and authors, preserved by a 3rd century AD grammarian named Athenaeus in his work called the Dipnosophistai, or Dinner Party as well as artistic evidence provided by black and red figure vase paintings and terracotta figurines. Over time, more and more Greeks presented themselves as food connoisseurs. From the Hellenistic period onward, the Greeks, at least the rich, no longer appeared to be any more austere than the others. The cultivated guests of the feast hosted by Athenaeus in the 3rd century AD devoted a large part of their conversation to wine and gastronomy. They discussed the merits of various wines, vegetables, and meats, mentioning renowned dishes and great cooks. The ancient Greeks consumed three to four meals a day. Breakfast, or akratismos, consisted of barley bread dipped in wine, known as akratos, hence the name of the meal, and was sometimes complemented by figs or olives. They also ate a sort of pancake, called taganitis, which derived from taganon, meaning frying pan. Taganites were made with wheat flour, olive oil, honey, and curled milk. Another kind of pancake, stytites, from stytinos, meaning a flour or dough. Stytites were topped with honey, sesame, and cheese. A quick lunch, called eristone, was taken around noon, or the early afternoon. Dinner, or dipnon, was the most important meal of the day, and was generally taken at nightfall. An additional light meal, called Hesperisma, was sometimes taken in the late afternoon. Aristodipnon, literally lunch dinner, was sometimes served in the late afternoon instead of dinner. Men and women took their meals separately. When the house was too small, the men ate first and then the women after them. Slaves waited for the family at dinners. Aristotle notes that the poor, who had no slaves, would ask their wives or children to serve the food. Respect held for the father here is obvious. The ancient Greek custom of placing terracotta miniatures of their furniture in children's graves gives us a good idea of the style and design of how they dined. The Greeks normally ate while seated on chairs, and benches or couches were used for banquets. The tables, high for normal meals and low for banquets, were initially rectangular in shape. By the 4th century BC, the usual table was round, often with three animal-shaped legs, such as lion's paws. Loaves of flat bread could be used as plates, but terracotta bowls were more common. Dishes became more refined over time, and by the Roman period, plates were sometimes made out of precious metals or glass. The use of the fork was unknown, though, as people ate with their fingers. Knives, however, were used to cut the meat, and spoons could be used for soups. Pieces of bread, called apomagdalia, sometimes were used as a substitute for the spoon, to soak up the food, or even as a napkin to wipe one's fingers with. Bread formed a major part of the diet, and some variant of it was eaten at every meal. The two main grains were wheat, called cetos, and barley, or crithe. Wheat grains were softened by soaking in water, then either reduced into gruel or pounded into flour, called aliata, and kneaded and formed into loaves, called artos or flatbreads, either plain or mixed with cheese or honey. Leavening was known, and the Greeks later used an alkaline, called nitron, or wine yeast, as a leavening agent. Dough loaves were baked at home in a clay oven, called ipnos, setting on three legs. The stone oven would not appear until the Roman period. 
A simpler method consisted of putting lighted coals on the floor and covering the heap with a dome-shaped cover called panegios. When it was hot enough, the coals were swept aside. The dough loaves were placed on the warm floor. The cover was put back in place, and the coals were heaped around the side of the cover. This method is still traditionally used in Serbia and elsewhere in the Balkans, where it is called krepulja, or sack. In the 6th century BC, Solon had prescribed that leavened bread be reserved for feast days, but by the end of the 5th century BC, leavened bread was sold at the Agora, though it was quite expensive. Wheat was difficult to grow in Mediterranean climates, and thus the bread made from it was associated with the upper classes in the ancient Mediterranean, while the poor ate coarser, darker breads made from barley. Although it was more difficult to make bread from, barley was much easier to produce, and it provided a nourishing, but very heavy bread. Because of this, it was often roasted before milling, producing a coarse flour, called alfita, which was used to make matzah, the basic Greek dish. In his play The Peace, Aristophanes employs the expression eisthen Christas monas, literally, to eat only barley, with a meaning equivalent to the English phrase a diet of bread and water. Many recipes are known for matzah. It could be served cooked or raw, as a broth, or made into dumplings or flatbreads. Like wheat breads, it could also be augmented with cheese or honey. In ancient Greece, bread was served with accompaniments known as opson, sometimes rendered in English as relish. This was a generic term which referred to anything which accompanied this staple food, whether meat or fish, fruit or vegetable. In ancient Greece, fruit and vegetables were a significant part of the diet, as the ancient Greeks consumed much less meat than is usual today. Legumes would have been important crops, as their ability to replenish exhausted soil was known, at least by the time of Xenophon. As one of the first domesticated crops to be introduced to Greece, lentils were also commonly eaten. Thick soup made from beans and lentils was also very popular. Vegetables were eaten in these soups, boiled or mashed, called etnos, and seasoned with olive oil, vinegar, herbs, or garon, a type of fish sauce. In the comedies of Aristophanes, Heracles was often portrayed as a glutton with a fondness for mashed beans. Poorer families ate oak acorns, called balanoi. Raw or preserved olives were a common appetizer. In the cities, fresh vegetables were expensive, and therefore the poor city dwellers had to make do with dried vegetables. Lentil soup, called fake, was the workman's typical dish, whereas cheese, garlic, and onions were the soldier's traditional fare. In Aristophanes' piece, the smell of onions typically represents soldiers, and so the chorus, celebrating the end of the war, sing, quote, Oh, joy, joy, no more helmet, no more cheese nor onions. End quote. Fruits, either fresh or dried, and nuts, were eaten as dessert. Important fruits were figs, raisins, and pomegranates. Athenaeus describes a decadent dessert made of figs and broad beans. Dried figs were also eaten as an appetizer, or when drinking wine. In the latter case, they were often accompanied by grilled chestnuts, chickpeas, and beech nuts, which absorbed the alcohol well. The consumption of fish and meat varied in accordance with the wealth and location of the household. In the country, hunting, primarily trapping, allowed for consumption of birds and hares. Peasants also had farmyards to provide them with chickens and geese. Slightly wealthier landowners could raise goats, pigs, or sheep. In the city, meat was expensive, except for pork. In Aristophanes' day, a piglet cost three drachmas, which was three days' wages for a typical worker. Sausages were common both for the poor and the rich. Most poor Athenians only tasted goat, lamb, or beef after religious ceremonies, where the sacrificial meat would have been distributed to the people. The Spartans primarily ate a soup made from pig's legs, salt, vinegar, and blood, known as melisomis, or black soup. According to Plutarch, it was, quote, so much valued that the elderly men fed only upon that, leaving what flesh there was to the younger, end quote. It was famous amongst the Greeks. A Sybarite man once joked, quote, Naturally Spartans are the bravest men in the world. Anyone in his senses would rather die 10,000 times than take his share of such a sorry diet, end quote. 
The dish was served with matzah, figs, and cheese, sometimes supplemented with game and fish. The 3rd century AD author, Alien, claims that Spartan cooks were prohibited from cooking anything other than meat. In the Greek islands and on the coast, fresh fish and seafood, such as squid, octopus, and shellfish, were common. They were eaten locally, but more often transported inland. Sardines and anchovies were regular fare for the citizens of Athens. They were sometimes sold fresh, but more frequently salted. Astele of the late 3rd century BC, from the small Boeotian city of Akrafia on Lake Copes, provides us with a list of fish prices. The cheapest was scarin, probably parrotfish, whereas Atlantic bluefin tuna was three times as expensive. Common saltwater fish were yellowfin tuna, red mullet, ray, swordfish, or sturgeon, a delicacy which was eaten salted. Lake Copes itself was famous in all of Greece for its eels, celebrated by the hero of Aristophanes' Acarnians. Other freshwater fish were pike, carp, and the less appreciated catfish. In classical Athens, eels, conger eels, and sea perch, called orphos, were considered to be great delicacies, while sprats were cheap and readily available. The ancient Greeks also bred quails and hens, partly to eat them and partly for their eggs. Athenaeus also praises pheasant eggs and Egyptian goose eggs, which were presumably rather rare. Eggs were cooked soft or hard-boiled as appetizers or dessert. Egg whites, yolk, and whole eggs were also used as ingredients in the preparation of dishes. Country dwellers drank milk, called gala, but it was seldom used in cooking. It came almost entirely from goats, though. Butter, called buteron, was known, but seldom used either, as the Greeks saw it as a culinary trait of the Thracians, of the northern Aegean, whom the comic poet Anaxandridas dubbed butter eaters. Yet the Greeks enjoyed other dairy products. Periate and oxygala were curled milk products, similar to cottage cheese or perhaps to yogurt. Most of all, goat's cheese, called tiros, was a staple food. Fresh and hard cheese were sold in different shops. The former cost about two-thirds of the latter's price. Cheese was eaten alone or with honey or vegetables. It was also used as an ingredient in the preparation of many dishes, including fish dishes. Of course, there was no sugar in the classical world. Honey, therefore, was very important. One well-known kind came from Mount Hymetos, about five kilometers east of Athens. In consequence of their frugality and the diminished regard for cuisine that it inspired, the kitchen long remained the domain of women, either free or enslaved. In the classical period, however, culinary specialists began to enter the written record. Both Alien and Athenaeus, albeit disapprovingly, mention the thousand or so cooks who accompanied Smendidri of Sybaris on his voyage to Athens at the time of Cleisthenes. Plato in his Gorgias mentions Quote, Therion the cook, Mythakos, the author of a treatise on Sicilian cooking, and Sarambos, the wine merchant, three eminent connoisseurs of cake, kitchen, and wine. End quote. Some chefs also wrote treatises on cuisine. Mythakos was a cookbook author of the late 5th century BC who was credited with bringing knowledge of Sicilian gastronomy to mainland Greece. Specifically, he worked in Sparta from which he was expelled as a bad influence, and then in Athens. He earned an unfavorable mention in Plato's dialogue, Gorgias, as we previously noted. Mythakos' cookbook was the first in Greek. In fact, he is the earliest cookbook author in any language whose name is known. One recipe survives from it, thanks to a quotation recorded by Athenaeus. It is in the Doric dialect of Greek, appropriate both to Greek Sicily and to Sparta, and describes, in one line, how to deal with tania, or the red bandfish, saying, quote, tania, gut, discard the head, rinse, slice, add cheese and olive oil, end quote. The addition of cheese seems to have been a controversial matter. Archistratus is quoted as warning his readers that Syracusan cooks spoil good fish by adding cheese. Archistratus was a 4th century BC poet from Syracuse who was known as the, quote, Daedalus of tasty dishes, end quote. His humorous didactic poem, Hedapathia, 
or The Life of Luxury, known only from quotations in Athenaeus, advises a gastronomic reader on where to find the best food in the Mediterranean world. The writer, who was styled in antiquity as the Hesiod or Theognis of gluttons, parodies the pithy style of older poets. Most of his attention is given to fish, although some fragments refer to appetizers, and there was also a section on wine. His poem had a certain notoriety amongst readers in the 4th and 3rd centuries BC. It was referred to by comic poets and even by the philosophers Aristotle and Chrysippus. In nearly every case, these references are disparaging, implying that Archistratus' poem, like the Sex Manual by Philanus, was likely to corrupt its readers, who study it and defile their banquets with such indecency. For those uninterested in sex manuals and fine dining, Orphicism and Pythagoreanism, two common ancient Greek cults, suggested a different way of life, based on a concept of purity and thus purification, called catharsis, a form of asceticism in the original sense. The Greek word askesis initially signified a ritual, and then it later became known as a specific way of life. Vegetarianism was a central element of Orphicism, and of several variants of Pythagoreanism. Empedocles justified vegetarianism by a belief in the transmigration of souls. After all, who could guarantee that an animal about to be slaughtered did not house the soul of a human being? However, it can be observed that Empedocles also included plants in his transmigration. Thus, the same logic should have applied to eating them as well. Vegetarianism was also a consequence of a dislike for killing. A character in Aristophanes' Frog says, quote, For Orpheus taught us rights and to refrain from killing. End quote. The information from Pythagoras is more difficult to define. The comedic authors describe Pythagoreans as strictly vegetarian, with some of them living on bread and water alone. Other traditions say that they prohibited the consumption of certain vegetables, such as the broad bean, or of sacred animals, such as the chicken, or selected animal parts. It follows that vegetarianism and the idea of ascetic purity were closely associated and often accompanied by sexual abstinence. In his treatise titled On the Eating of Flesh, Plutarch elaborated on the barbarism of blood spilling. Inverting the usual terms of debate, he asked the meat-eater to justify his choice. Alien claims that the first athlete to submit to a formal diet was Ikos of Teros, a victor in the Olympic pentathlon in 444 BC. However, Olympic wrestling champion Milo of Croton was already said to eat 20 pounds of meat and 20 pounds of bread and to drink 8 quarts of wine each day. Before his time, athletes were said to practice xerophagia, from xeros, or dry, and phagos, or food, and thus it was a diet based on dry foods, such as dried figs, fresh cheese, and bread. Pythagoras, either the philosopher or a gymnastics master of the same name, was the first to direct athletes to eat meat only. Trainers later enforced some standard diet rules. In order to be an Olympic victor, quote, you have to eat according to regulations, keep away from desserts, you must not drink cold water, nor can you have a drink of wine whenever you want, end quote. It seems this diet was primarily based on meat, for Galen, in the 2nd century AD, accused athletes of his day of, quote, always gorging themselves on flesh and blood, end quote. The most widespread drink was water. Fetching water was a daily task for women. Though wells were common, spring water was preferred. It was recognized as nutritious because it caused plants and trees to grow, and also as a desirable beverage. Pindar called spring water as agreeable as honey. According to Athenaeus, the Greeks would describe water with such adjectives as robust, heavy or light, dry, acidic, pungent, wine-like, and so forth. One of the characters in a play, by the comic poet Antiphony, claimed that he could recognize Attic water by taste alone. Athenaeus states that a number of philosophers had a reputation for drinking nothing but water, a habit combined with a vegetarian diet. The Greeks also drank kikion, from the verb kikeo, meaning to shake or mix, which is both a beverage and a meal. It was a barley gruel, to which water and herbs were added. 
Used as a ritual beverage in the Eleusinian mysteries, Kikion was also a popular beverage, especially in the countryside. Theophrastus, in his characters, describes a boorish peasant as having drunk much Kikion and inconveniencing the ecclesia with his bad breath. Kikion also had a reputation as a good digestive, and as such, in Aristophanes' piece, Hermes recommends it to the main character who has eaten too much dried fruit. The usual drinking vessel was a skiffos, which was made out of wood, terracotta, or metal. They also used the kilix, a shallow bowl, and for banquets, the cantharos, a deep cup with handles, or the riton, a drinking horn often molded into the form of a human or animal head. The most common style of wine in ancient Greece was sweet and aromatic, though drier wines were also produced. Color ranged from darkish red to pink to nearly clear white. Oxidation was difficult to control, which meant that many wines did not retain their quality beyond the next vintage. However, wines that were successfully stored well and were able to age were highly prized. The 5th century BC comedian Hermippus described the best mature wines as having a bouquet of violets, roses, and hyacinth. He also joked that Greek women liked their wine old, but their men young. Wine was almost always diluted, especially with water or snow when the wine was to be served cold. The Greeks believed that only barbarians drank unmixed or undiluted wine, called akraton, and this practice was likely to lead to madness and even death. They asserted that the dilution of wine with water was a mark of civilized behavior, whose contrast was embodied in the myth of the Battle of the Lapiths with the centaurs, who were inflamed to rape women and cause mayhem because of their drinking of undiluted wine. Wine preserved for local use was kept in pouches of animal skins, usually goats. That which was destined for sale was poured into pithoi, or large terracotta jugs. They were then decanted into amphorae, sealed with pitch for retail sale. Vintage wines carried stamps from the producers or city magistrates who guaranteed their origin. This is one of the first instances of indicating the geographical or qualitative provenance of a product. In ancient times, the reputation of a wine depended on the region that the wine came from, rather than an individual producer or vineyard. Like early wine critics, Greek poets would extol the virtues of certain wines and review less favorably those not up to their standards. The wines most frequently cited as being of good quality were those of Chios, Lesbos, and Thassos, and Cretan wine came to prominence later. In the 4th century BC, the most expensive wine sold in the Athenian Agora was that from Chios, which sold for between a quarter of a drachma, up to two drachmas, for about the equivalent of four standard 750 milliliter wine bottles today. A secondary wine made from water and pumice the residue from squeezed grapes, mixed with leeks, was made by country folk for their own use. The Greeks sometimes sweetened their wine with honey, as well as being flavored with pine resin. Alien also mentions a wine mixed with perfume. Cooked wine was known, as well as a sweet wine from Thassos, similar to a dessert wine. The ancient Greeks pioneered new methods of viticulture and wine production, and as the Greek city-states established colonies throughout the Mediterranean during the Archaic period, the settlers brought grape vines with them and were active in cultivating the wild vines that they encountered. Sicily and southern Italy formed some of the earliest colonies, as they were areas already home to abundance of grape vines. The Greeks gave the name of Onatria, or the Land of the Vines, to the southern part of the Italian peninsula. Settlements in Massalia in southern France and along the shores of the Black Sea soon followed. The result was a major influence on the ancient European winemaking cultures of the Etruscans, Celts, Scythians, and ultimately the Romans. In establishing colonies in these various locations, there was an expectation that not only colonial wine production would supply their domestic needs, but also create trading opportunities to meet the demand of the nearby city-states. Athens itself provided a large and lucrative market for wine, with significant vineyard estates forming in Attica and on the island of Thassos to help satisfy demand. 
The grape clusters, vines, and wine cups that adorn Greek coins from the classical times bear witness to the importance of wine to the ancient Greek economy. With every major trading partner, from the Crimea, Egypt, Scythia, Etruria, and beyond, the Greeks traded their knowledge of viticulture and winemaking, as well as the fruits of their own production. Millions of amphora pieces, bearing the unique seals of various city-states and Aegean islands, have been uncovered by archaeologists, demonstrating the scope of Greek influence. A shipwreck discovered off the coast of southern France included nearly 10,000 amphorae, containing nearly 300,000 liters, or 79,000 gallons, of Greek wine, presumably destined for trade up the Rhone and Sion rivers into Gaul. It is estimated that the Greeks shipped nearly 10 million liters of wine into Gaul each year through Mesalia. In 1929, the discovery of the so-called Vix grave in Burgundy, which had never been looted, included several rich artifacts demonstrating the strong ties between Greek wine traders and local Celtic villagers. The most notable of these was a large Greek-made crater destined to hold over 1,000 liters, or 260 gallons, of wine. Standing 1.63 meters, or 5 feet 4 inches high, it is the largest known metal vessel from the period. During the 6th and 5th centuries BC, the Vic settlement sat on an agriculturally rich plain and appears to have been in control of an important trading node, where the Syene crossed the land route leading from the Mediterranean to northern Europe. In addition to its significance as a trade commodity, wine also served important religious, medical, and social purposes in ancient Greek society. The mysterious cult of Dionysus was very active throughout Attica and would become immortalized in Euripides' famous play, The Bacchae. Four festivals were held throughout the Athenian calendar year in honor of the god of wine. The Anthesteria, the city Dionysia, the Linnea, and the royal Dionysia. The Anthesteria was held each year from the 11th to the 13th of the month of Anthesterion, or late February, early March, celebrating the beginning of spring and marking the ceremonious opening of the wine jars, or pithoi, from the previous autumn's harvest. The Anthesteria also held aspects of a festival celebrating the dead, as the Keres, or the daughters of the night god Nyx, who are thus female death spirits, were worshipped and allowed to freely roam the city. It's for this reason that some scholars have etymologically connected the name Anthesteria to the Greek verb anathesosthai, or to pray up, in reference to the aspect that during this festival, the dead were believed to be walking amongst the living. Others, however, believe that it comes from the word anthos, or flower, and thus refers to the blooming of the grapevine. Regardless, this was a very old festival. Thucydides even notes that it was more ancient than both the city and royal Dionysia. Since it was not only celebrated by Athens, but also by the rest of the Ionian cities, it is assumed that it must have preceded the Ionian migration of the 11th century BC, and thus extends far back into the late Bronze Age. On the first day, called Pithoigia, literally the jar opening, the previously mentioned jars of wine were opened. Libations were offered to Dionysus, and the entire household, including the slaves, joined in the festivities. People flocked to Athens from the vineyards of Attica, farmers, laborers, and slaves alike. Spring flowers were used to decorate the rooms of the house, the home's drinking vessels, and any children over three years of age. It was at sundown that the new pithoi of wine were probably opened. On the second day, called koai, literally the pouring, the merrymaking continued. People dressed themselves merrily, summoned the figures of Dionysus' entourage, the satyrs, and paid a round of visits to their acquaintances. According to Aristophanes and his Acarnians, drinking clubs held contests to see who could drain their wine cups the most rapidly. Others poured libations on the tombs of deceased relatives. It also included what has been described as a rite of passage for little boys who had reached the age of three the usual age of weaning. They were crowned with spring flowers and given presents, including miniature versions of the wine jugs, called coes. The giving and the receiving of a child's first jug was a significant event in family life. Infants who died before they could participate were sometimes buried with these jugs, 
which are often painted with scenes of chubby boys, all but naked except for their amulet strings, playing with small dogs, riding in carts, or making offerings of libations and cakes. The day concluded with a state occasion. A peculiarly solemn and secret ceremony took place in the sanctuary of Dionysus in Limnace, or in the marshes, which was closed throughout the rest of the year. Despite the name, there were no actual marshes in the immediate surroundings of Athens, and it was believed that the sanctuary was located in the Bulletarion in the Athenian Agora. Athens's ritual queen, the Basilina, underwent a sacred marriage, called a Hieros Gamos, to the god, played by her actual, in-real-life husband, the Archon Basileus. Precisely what this entailed, and how physical was the public union, remain matters of discussion, but it may have involved intercourse, or it may have not. The Basilina was assisted by the Gerari, or 14 Athenian matrons, chosen by the Archon Basileus. The exact duties of these matrons is also unknown, as they were sworn to secrecy. It has been suggested that this ceremony was a recreation of the marriage of Ariadne to Dionysus, after Theseus had abandoned her during their escape from Knossos. The first two days of the festival celebrated Dionysus as the god of wine, but on the third day, called Kytroi, literally the pots, took place a festival of the dead. At the beginning of the day, people would chew the leaves of a species of hawthorn that was thought to ward off ghosts, and the doors of their houses were painted with pitch, indicating that this was a day of pollution. Families celebrated from inside the house. Fruit or cooked legumes were offered to Hermes in his capacity as Hermes Chthonios, an underworld figure, and to the souls of the dead, who were then bidden to depart the festival and the city. None of the Olympians were included in this Halloween-like festival, and no one tasted the pottage, a thick soup that was the food of the dead. Although no performances were allowed at the theater, a sort of rehearsal took place, at which the participants for the ensuing dramatic festival were selected. That dramatic festival, known as the City Dionysia, included theatrical performances of both comedies and tragedies in honor of the god of wine. We will cover this festival and tragedy in greater detail on the next episode. The medicinal use of wine was frequently studied by the Greeks, including Hippocrates, who did extensive research on the topic. Adding thyme, pennyroyal, and other herbs as an edict, he used wine as a cure for fevers, to ease recovery, and as a disinfectant. He also studied the effect of wine on his patient's stool. Various types of wine were prescribed by Greek doctors for use as an analgesic, diuretic, tonic, and digestive aid. The Greeks were also aware of some negative health effects, especially those arising from the consumption of wine beyond moderation. Athenaeus made frequent mention of wine's ability to induce hangovers the following day, and he even suggested various remedies for it. Alien mentions that the wine from the Heraii, a festival to Hera in Arcadia, rendered men foolish, but women fertile. Conversely, a key in wine was thought to induce abortion. Outside of these religious and therapeutic uses, Greek society did not approve of women drinking wine regularly. In fact, according to Alien, a Messalian law prohibited this and restricted women to drinking only water. Sparta was the only city where women routinely drank wine whenever and wherever they wanted. Wine was also a central component at the symposium, or drinking party, which was a very popular social event in Athens. It comes from the Greek word sympenein, which means to drink together. Such parties were often depicted on attic vase paintings from the 6th and 5th centuries BC, as well as the wall paintings from the tomb of the diver found at Poseidonia, or Paestum. In addition, two of Socrates' pupils, Plato and Xenophon recorded the events of a dinner party attended by the great philosopher, and the symposium was discussed in a number of Greek elegiac poems from the 6th and 5th centuries BC. In modern usage, the word symposium has come to mean an academic conference, but do not be confused. Although some learning did in fact take place, the ancient Greek version was meant for debauchery. In fact, the guests often became so drunk that they had to be carried home by their slaves. As one can imagine, the symposium was a key social institution for the ancient Greeks. It was a forum for men of privileged families to debate, plot, 
boast or simply to revel with others. They were frequently held to celebrate the introduction of young men into the aristocratic society, as well as other special occasions, such as to honor victors in athletic and poetic contests. Plato's Symposium, for example, was in honor of the poet Agathon on the occasion of his first victory at the theater contest in the Dionysia of 416 BC. The celebration, though, was upstaged by the unexpected entrance of the man who at that point was the toast of the town, the young Alcibiades, who dropped in drunkenly and nearly naked after leaving another symposium. So as we can see, although these parties were private affairs, gate crashing was quite common. Etruscan art also shows scenes of banqueting similar to Greek symposia. However, one major difference is that Greek women of citizen status were not permitted to participate, where in Etruria they were. However, non-citizen women were allowed to attend, as we shall see. In Athens, a symposium took place in the Andron, or the men's quarters of the household, secluded from the sight of the household women. Slaves removed the sandals of the guest participants, called symposiasts, and they took their places on pillowed couches, called clinae, along the three walls, away from the door. Due to space limitations, the couches numbered between seven and nine, limiting the total number of participants to somewhere between 14 and 27. For this occasion, the walls were decorated with flowers and long streamers of vine or ivy, and the guests wore garlands. Finger bowls with tragamata, or snacks, were placed on small three-legged tables in front of the couches, and the guests would eat while reclining. Oftentimes the food was chestnuts, beans, toasted wheat, or honey snacks, all intended to absorb alcohol and thus extend the drinking spree. Xenophon says that if any young men took part, they were not allowed to recline, but instead had to sit upright. After eating, the guests washed their hands and slaves removed the tables. Then, the proper drinking party began. Certain formalities were first observed though, most important among which were the libations. Undiluted wine was then brought around so the guests could offer a libation to Dionysus, the god of wine. The guests sprinkled some on the ground, invoking the god's name as they did so. They sang a hymn to the god and elected a symposiarchos, or lord of the drinking party. His job was to decide the appropriate strength of the wine for the evening's festivities. The strength was dictated by the level of water used to dilute the wine. Simply put, the less water, the stronger the wine. Greek wine was thick and sweet, and so the Greeks normally drank it diluted wine because the drinking of undiluted wine was considered a habit of uncivilized peoples. We are told that, quote, it gives good cheer to those who mix and drink it moderately, but mix half and half, and you get madness, unmixed, total collapse, end quote. But for the symposium, they needed something a bit stronger than normal consumption, the strength of which depended on whether serious discussions or merely sensual indulgence were on the agenda. If it was the former, they would engage in discussions on a multitude of topics, often philosophical, such as love and the differences between genders, which were the themes for Plato's symposium. In his account, he has seven long speeches on the nature of love. Some of them are witty, some rather boring, and some quite profound. Plato in his Protagoras writes, quote, When civilized, educated people have a party. You won't see flute players or dancers or harpists there. They are quite able to entertain themselves, without this sort of facetious nonsense. They talk amongst themselves, speaking and listening in turn, and all quite calmly, even if they have been drinking very heavily. End quote. While the symposiasts reclined on the couches, youths filled and refilled their wine cups, called achillix. The wine was drawn from a crater, a large jar designed to be carried by two men and served from pitchers, called oenokoi, in a fragment from a play titled Dionysus by the 4th century BC comedian Eubulus. Dionysus describes proper and improper drinking, saying, quote, For sensible men, I prepare only three craters, one for health, which they drank first, the second for love and pleasure, and the third for sleep. After the third one is drained, Wise men go home. The fourth crater is not mine anymore. It belongs to bad behavior. The fifth is for shouting. 
The sixth is for rudeness and insults. The seventh is for fighting. The eighth is for breaking the furniture. The ninth is for vomiting. And the tenth is for madness and unconsciousness. End quote. This seems like a very accurate description to me, and it's a bit reassuring to realize that some things never change. In keeping with the Greek virtue of moderation, though, the Symposiarchos was supposed to prevent the festivities from getting out of hand, but Greek literature and art often indicate that the third crater limit was not usually observed. The quantity of bowls to represent moderation is a recurring theme throughout Greek writing. If the agenda for the evening was not intended for philosophical discussions, and most likely ended with more than three craters having been consumed, and therefore was a bit less civilized, as Plato would say, there were other forms of entertainment that may have taken place. Xenophon's account of the symposium is a bit more relaxed and probably more realistic. It begins with a professional funny man arriving uninvited and trying to amuse the other guests by telling jokes. When his third joke fell flat, he covers his head with his cloak and bursts into tears. This raises a laugh, and the party goes on. A sort of cabaret is brought on, two girls and a boy, who dance and play the flute and the lyre. There are acrobatics, too. Xenophon writes, quote, After this, a circular frame was brought in, with upright swords set around its rim. The dancer did somersaults into the frame and out of it again over the swords, so that the spectators were afraid she would injure herself. But she completed the performance confidently and safely. End quote. While Xenophon describes one particular party, each was likely very different, and the excitement of what the host had planned was probably part of the allure. Although free women of status did not attend symposia, high-class female prostitutes, called hetairai, and entertainers were hired to perform, consort, and converse with the guests. Poetry and music were central to the pleasures of the symposium. Among the musical instruments played was the alus, a Greek flute-like instrument. It was common to have at least one flute girl at the party, and they were shown on vases performing in the nude. Also, a boy and a girl slave typically would perform an erotic dance portraying Dionysus' love for Ariadne. When stringed instruments were played, it was usually the barbiton, which essentially was a bass version of the cathara. Poetry was often recited, either what a guest had made up himself, or passages from well-known poets. Another feature of the symposia were scalia, or drinking songs, of a patriotic or body nature that were accompanied by the lyre. They were performed competitively with one symposiast reciting the first part of a song, and another expected to improvise the end of it, implementing puns, jokes, or in some way cleverly modifying the former song. The fact that many scolia were written by poets such as Alcius, Anacreon, Praxilla, Simonides, Sappho, and Pindar shows in what high esteem scolia were held by the Greeks. The so-called Scolion of Seclios, which is dated much later to the Hellenistic period, has been found with the original music in the ancient Greek notation, and thus is the oldest complete example of ancient Greek music that we have. But it shows us that these scolia, poetry, music, and the symposium, were very connected in Greek society. So as we can see, as the symposiasts drank, they engaged in discussions, sometimes lighthearted, sometimes philosophical, enjoyed musical performances, and engaged in song singing. But of course, then as in now, we couldn't have anything drinking related without turning it into an agon, or competition. And the Greeks, as well as the Etruscans, especially loved to play a specific drinking game, called katapos. The game appears to have been of Sicilian origin but spread to Greece and became especially fashionable at Athens. Very many classical poets and dramatists make allusion to the game, and it appears on vases from the era. The rules were simple. The player leant on his left elbow and held his kilix in his right hand. His left hand had to remain stationary, with his right hand hooking his right index finger into the front handle of his kilix, He swirled the dregs of his wine around and around in the cup, once he achieved enough momentum, then he flung the wine at a target across the room. The object was to hit a tiny statuette, called a plastinx, that balanced on top of a small bronze stand with its arms outstretched. Halfway down the stand was a larger disc, called the manes. 
To be successful, the player had to knock off the plastics in such a way that it would fall to the manes and make a bell-like sound. Both the wine thrown and the noise made were called latex. Much like with modern beer pong, ringing the disc and thus winning was a source of pride for them. Throwing too much wine so that some spilt during its passage through the air was a disqualifier. And much like spilling your beer at a party, it was most likely a party foul. Players were also judged by the elegance of their throwing as much as by their accuracy. Although the game involved a great deal of dexterity and sheer luck, like all games in which the element of chance found a place, it was regarded as more or less ominous of the future success of the players, especially in matters of love. And of course, the excitement was sometimes further augmented by monetary bets. So basically, just to wrap it all up, at the symposia, participants drank, played music, sang songs, played games, told stories, and oftentimes flirted, either with female hetairai, younger slaves, or even amongst themselves, all in a spirit of competition and conquest. They competed in a wit and argument, in poetry and learning, and in eroticism, while strutting their wealth, status, and social solidarity. Some vases and wall paintings show scenes of homoerotic activity, where the emphasis seems to be on drinking and gaming as a preamble to sex. And so that's the symposium, one of the famous celebrations of Dionysus to come out of antiquity. On the next episode, we will take a look at another example of the pleasures of Dionysus. So join me next time on the History of Ancient Greece, Episode 49, Theater and the Dionysia.